Hi again, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Next Chapter, a podcast featuring alumni from the College of Fine Arts and Communication at Western Illinois University. My name is Buzz Hoon. I'm the interim dean for the college, and I'm also the host of the podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of talking with Caitlin Egan, who received two degrees, a bachelor's in 2012 and a master's in 2014, and then communication sciences and disorders. That department now is known as speech pathology and audiology. So first of all, Caitlin, welcome to the podcast and and thank you so much for being my second guest. All right. Thanks so much for having me, Buzz. Um, I'm Caitlin. I am a speech language pathologist currently living and practicing in Chicago. Great. And we're going to kind of talk about your journey, um, not only to where to, to WIU, but also then how you got to where you are in Chicago. But let's go all the way back. Let's talk about some let's of the things, <laughs> things growing up in, in, in the south suburbs of Chicago. Um, you know, I always like to kind of think, uh, what's a bigger influence on, on a young person? Is it family? Is it community and friends? What kind of things do you think early on kind of shaped you into who you are as an adult? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I would definitely say a nice mixture of family and, um, my, uh, participation and leadership throughout athletics throughout my entire life. Um, you know, I, I was a volleyball player from very early on and that's actually kind of how I, uh, got connected originally with, uh, Western by being recruited there to play volleyball. Um, and then also, you know, my family, I feel like, (laughs) um, they're always kind of my go-to people to, uh, kind of make decisions with and kind of bounce things off of. So it's a nice mixture of, of kind of the takeaways from being a student athlete my entire life and having a nice sounding board uh, with my mom and my dad and my brother. I'm sure that was uh, growing up just a big commitment uh, in terms of all, because I know I had two kids that were involved in athletics mm-hmm. and it is a, a big time commitment and also just a, uh, you know, making sure that people get where they need to be. Uh, And so I'm sure that was something that you understood their support early on. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I I think, you know, it has to go without saying is, you know, none none of it's really possible without that uh, support system, you know, waking up at 4am with me to drive me to a volleyball tournament where I could potentially be recruited, like, you know, three hours away, just to pack it up and go home back to Chicago, uh, same day. So, so yeah, very, very fortunate. So uh, we have you grown up in Evergreen Park. And um, as you went through high school, Caitlin, what kind of things you, you obviously you're playing some volleyball, other things that you may have done uh, that you really enjoyed in high school that uh, you still remember? Yeah, definitely. Um, so obviously involved, very much so involved in athletics, um, but I also was a musician. So mm. I was involved in um, concert band and marching band um, and ended up uh, being the drum major for my high school marching band the last two years of um, high school. So I was kind of that, um, you know, odd mixture of varsity athlete team captain, but still, you know, marching in the band at halftime. So an exhausting, but absolutely fantastic high school experience. Did, did you have a sense early on that you were knowing or or maybe you weren't aware of it at the time that you were somehow involved in some leadership positions though that somehow this was preparing you for maybe a career in maybe you didn't know what but it was somehow setting you up yeah I think so I think that's something that I recognize um you know pretty early on even in high school um I think uh, my dad, especially, and my mom too, of course, um, have always been very much so, um, you know, proponents of work ethic and, and commitment. Um, so I truly was never, and still, and not, and never was the best volleyball player ever, and certainly was not the best flautist either. Um, however, but I think you know, it's just that work ethic and commitment yeah. and, and interpersonal skills that kind of started me down my leadership journey, even even in high school. There's something about just that confidence and, and, and the, 
not worrying so much about failure, but just giving everything a try. I think that really helps set off a young person in the right direction early on. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I think too, my time um, with the marching band, I think that brought like a whole nother um, aspect of leadership that, you know, I didn't even realize I, I, I could have or I could develop. So yeah, definitely a nice, well-rounded experience that that set me up very nicely for, for headed into uh, college at WIU in 2008. Jeez, that was so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> it seems seems not oh, so yeah. long ago to me, but uh, I guess for, for you, yeah, I guess it does <laughs> seem like it's been a few years. So as you said, you came, but now did you know what you were going to major in? How did you find that this would be your subject area? Yeah, so when you hear uh, speech language pathology, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, you have a family member that you know experienced a stroke and couldn't talk anymore. And, you know, you know, is that why you got into the field? And, you know, um, my story is a little different. Uh, my father definitely um, looking out for me, set some parameters as far as, you know, kind of ideas, very lightly suggested <laughs> ideas. Um, a list of 10 uh, majors for me to consider. Um, and at the time I was rolling my eyes and, and kind of annoyed that he was putting those parameters on me. Um, however, one of those was communication sciences and disorders. And I'll have you know that it is the major within that list of 10 that required the least amount of math because <laughs> I am not a math person. Um, so, you know, I don't have any warm and fuzzy story besides the fact that my dad kind of proposed 10 options. And I said, you know what, I've always liked writing. I've always liked language. I, I do feel like I, you know, connect and communicate well with others. So let's give it a go. Um, and there really was no turning back after, after I started. So way to go, Marty. Yeah, Marty, Marty for the win. Yeah, he gets a <laughs> shout out, I guess. <laughs> so there. Yeah. So there are two things that I found in my experience with uh, with students from your area, and 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 this is just uh, my interaction with them. First of all, you have to be a very good student, even though maybe you don't have to know as much math. You still have to be a really strong student, very competitive uh, classes. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. the other thing is, you mentioned that you have to have a caring for others. You have to have this. Uh, this desire that you want to help others, uh, because I think in that area, everybody is going, you're going to be helping somebody early on. And, and sure. is that something that you, you felt like that was a natural kind of fit for you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I think, you know, one thing that I has always stuck with me, um, and I think it's something I read in like English class, senior year of high school, but um, really, at the end of the day, what is life but to connect with others and how do we connect with others um, is through communication. So um, it's very meaningful to me to be able to help others connect um, and and to help family members understand how they can they can help their loved ones um, connect. So that's really always been kind of my driving force. So let's talk about just right now your undergrad experience, because I, I can't even imagine. I know. I know. Uh, from covering uh, athletics here um, for a number of years with our sports production that uh, the demands on a student athlete, it is like a full-time job. Um, yes. And so yeah. did you real? I mean, when you came in, you must've known what you're getting into. Yes and no. Um, you know, just being a, a student athlete in high school, I was kind of like, eh, you know, I, I can hang with this. You know, I've always been busy. Um, I've always done pretty well in school. So, uh, you know, let's go for it. Um, it definitely is elevated, though. Um, I think just that travel component of being on the road, getting home at, let's say you're in Chicago for a road match, you're getting home at 2 a.m. and um, you, you better be at class at 8 a.m. the next day. Um, your coaches are watching that. Um, you know, that, that was a grind for sure. Um, so although I thought I like knew it was going to be tough once you're in it, you're like, okay, yeah, this is, this is brutal, but you know, I wouldn't trade my experience for the world. And I do feel like, um, having that rigorous of um, a schedule throughout the first four years totally set me up for success later in life. Because I imagine you'd have to be really disciplined with your time 
and, uh, and make the really smart decisions about um, what you're going to be doing and, and how to get things accomplished. Because they're, especially with the classes that you had as an undergrad, I mean, you, you needed to, um, to reserve that time, that off time that you had to getting things done. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that I've always been a competitive person. Um, and <laughs> I guess competitive in the classroom too. That's um, good. you know, I I'm still very, very close friends with a lot of my colleagues that I went to undergrad and graduate school. I talked to them on a daily basis. Um, however, you know, I think there was a certain pride within myself to make sure that, um, I, I wasn't put in that category of, oh, you know, she's going to get a free pass because they know she's been traveling all week. Um, I, I knew that um, I wanted to prove to myself and maybe a couple others that I could, you know, kind of handle, handle that balance. But uh, more than that, come out as a leader, um, not only for the volleyball team, but um, within the department as well. So you, you had some opportunities to start to get some hands-on experience as an undergrad, right? Oh, Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the best things about Western. I think it's very unique in the fact that um, at the undergraduate level, um, being a, you know, a student clinician as an undergrad and being able to take on a caseload of patients within the, the speech clinic at Western is, is so unique. Um, and so I was able to take on some um, pediatric clients um, and, and work with them for speech and language intervention. But then I also was able to work at the hearing clinic, um, which is right down the hall from the speech clinic. Um, and that's really kind of how I found my groove in working with uh, individuals with hearing loss because I pretty much uh, ate, slept, and worked in the hearing clinic through undergrad and graduate school. And during that time, you you got to work out along with and under uh, Amanda Silver and, and uh, learn a little bit from her, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, pretty early on, I knew that I absolutely loved um, all of my classes that she taught. I just, you know, she's got great energy when she when she teaches. And um, I was very fascinated by, you know, the relationship between hearing and speech and language development. Um, so I really kind of jumped at any opportunity to um, learn from her and, and, and serve under her leadership. Um, so I started working in hearing clinics, started doing, you know, audiological evaluations under her observation, and then ended up being able to um, troubleshoot hearing aids, fit hearing aids. Um, so yeah, so overall great experience um, and nice to have uh, Amanda as uh, a mentor my entire six, basically six years there. But she was the one who told me because I was thinking about um, when you're a speech pathology and audiology undergrad. After you graduate with your bachelor's, you kind of have to go decide, do you want to go the speech pathology route and get your master's in two years, or do you want to get your clinical doctorate in audiology and become an audiologist? And I was so team audiology for a while. And, and Amanda being the fantastic mentor that, that she was, um, you know, kind of sat me down and said, you've got the communication skills, you know, let's, why don't you shoot for being a speech path and supporting individuals with hearing loss? And, and that's kind of how it all started. So. That's interesting that, you know, you could have gone either way, but you, you chose that route instead. But that, that, and that's the advantage, uh, as you said, that WIU provides for many of our students is it gives them an opportunity to have that experience and then find out where their possible uh, skills will lead them. Um, yeah. yeah. So let's talk, Caitlin, a little bit about some of the uh, things that you remember, the fun experiences and activities you remember doing as an undergrad, because uh, you, you, whatever comes to mind, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, going out to, you know, the local downtown eating establishments, what kind of things did you like to do? <laughs> well, it's funny that you say that because I was um, speaking with some of my graduate school friends and telling them that I was doing this today. And I actually said I was going to hijack the entire thing and um, give a 45 minute presentation about how Macomb, Illinois is the city of ranches, like ranch dressings. Because <laughs> <laughs> I am um, such a, a big fan of like so many of the restaurants in Macomb, but they have the best ranch dressing in the Midwest and like multiple establishments. So you can, uh, you can tell that I did my fair share of eating and drinking in Macomb. Um, <laughs> Definitely very allegiant to chicks, sports corner. Uh, people sleep on magnolias. I absolutely love magnolias. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think some of them are, it's sad, like Aurelio's isn't there anymore. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think going out to eat uh, sticks with me the most um, because that's what I did during undergrad. Um, I didn't really have much of a social life, uh, you know, in fall season because we were so busy, um, you know, playing through our, our season. Um, but what I do remember is every home game, my parents being there um, and taking me out to eat afterwards. So I'd have like four ice bags on both shoulders, both knees, um, you know, totally just like dripping through chicks and, and sports corner. Um, but really just kind of like sitting with my parents um, and maybe some other teammates and just kind of like chilling there. Um, you know, those small moments are the ones that I remember the most. That, that's so great that you, as you mentioned, you had um, you had the spa support group of, as you said, the, whether it's faculty and other students that you were in, and then you had the volleyball team members mm -hmm. as well as a separate. Did you, you know, um, I'm sure that at both times you you grew to realize the importance of those in your life. Oh yeah, big time. And the best part is, um, you know, after a while. Um, you know, my, my communication sciences and disorder, uh, friends and, and colleagues got to know my volleyball friends and, and it really was kind of like a, a nice meshing of both worlds. Um, so, so yeah, I look very much so fondly back on both my time in athletics and then my time in, in CSD or what's now called spa, I guess we're calling it spa. That's the, yeah. the cool way to say it. Yeah. I, I, it's been okay. a while since I called it CSD and, and, yeah. and yeah, but we, we did that for years. Yeah. So, um, let, let's talk a little bit about your transition into graduate school because, um, you know, that's, uh, I think for for some students, it's it, it's hard to realize that graduate school is not a fifth year of being an undergraduate. Yeah. It is a, it's intense and it's much more competitive and a, and a much more detailed study. And, mm -hmm. and and I'm sure there was a time where as you went into that, you thought, OK, I need to really focus a little bit more. Yeah, um, definitely. And I think what's nice about the program at Western is, you know, that junior, senior year of undergrad in the spa department, they're, they're gearing you up for that. Um, so I think they do a great job of kind of uh, lessening that, that, that brutal transition from like, oh, wow, I'm a college kid to, oh, wow, now I have to grow up and think about what I want to do for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, definitely had those thoughts, but really not, um, not as jarring as you would expect, especially since I stayed for my master's. I had like five or six other opportunities, um, all within Illinois for um, to complete my graduate coursework. So I definitely spent some time touring those um, facilities and, and meeting with faculty there. Um, but you know what, I just, I was so happy. I absolutely love the faculty at Western. Um, I, I just had to stay and I'm so happy that I did because I don't think I would be where I'm at if I went anywhere else. Let's talk about some other faculty or students. What, who do you remember from that period of time? Did you, did you have people that you like to hang out with and in between <laughs> classes? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, as I, as I mentioned, I mean, student wise, I still hang, I still hang out well virtually now because no one's hanging out, but um, you know, my, my good friends in, in the speech path grad program, uh, we've got Chad and Morgan and Rachel and Courtney. Um, that was kind of our, our core group. And, you know, I don't think we ever left Memorial hall. Um, Maybe sometimes we wanted to, but it was just so natural for us to just kind of live there and hang there. And that was our space and it was comfortable. And, um, you know, we, we would close the place down at 1 a.m., you know, studying for tests. Um, and like in the moment, you're kind of like, oh, this sucks. I don't want to study anymore. But then like looking back again, those are like the little moments where I'm like, no, that was so much fun because throughout all that time studying and ordering a thousand orders of Jimmy John's or Pizza Hut or something. I just feel like we like literally like peed our pants laughing every single night. Um, so, so yeah, so that was great. And, you know, as far as faculty, 
Uh, I was really fortunate enough to learn from obviously Amanda, but uh, Kate Pole Peter, who uh, you know retired within the past. I think she retired maybe three years ago now. Yeah. Um, she was our uh, neurology and dysphagia swallowing disorders um, instructor and advisor for quite some time. Um, she was. Uh, one of the most incredible individuals to learn from just her teaching style is fantastic. Very um, dry then, humor, very dry humor. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. She was the one who took me on my tour um, of the, the department when I was getting recruited to play volleyball there. I, I said I was interested in the department. She did my tour. Um, and I'll never forget. She like in real time morphed into like 10 different people with different communication disorders just to like explain the, the wide scope of the profession. And I'll never forget like walking out of there being like, that was equally awesome and equally terrifying. Like, I don't know if I can do this, but she totally made a mark. <laughs> and, you know, I'm so fortunate to have learned from her. And then um, supervising wise, you know, having a good supervisor in the clinic is so important. Um, I had great supervisors in um, Julie Cox and um, Amy Burke. Um, so yeah, I mean, the it's a very intimate uh, staff size, I'd say. So I feel like I got to know all of them so well. Um, and now, you know, we're friends on Facebook and I feel like we're, it's cool because I feel like they're my colleagues now um, as, you know, both speech pathologists. Well, they all have great respect for you. And what you, oh, what you they do, they, they have great respect for well, that's you. That's nice to hear. Yes, very much so. So, Caitlin, let's talk. What I thought was interesting is even though you uh, were done with volleyball, you still stayed connected, I think. Uh, and it, maybe it was a natural connection that to athletics in general, whether it was intramurals or you, you took time to, you know, uh, did you announce <laughs> volleyball games? Yeah. Like that? That's awesome. Yeah, they found they someone crazy enough to fill in when they didn't have their like typical announcers. Um, and yeah, it worked. I mean, I did it a handful of times and somehow it worked out and I still had some good friends that were still playing for the team. So they just thought it was a riot. Um, if I known this, I would have had you announce for us uh, on the TV broadcast too. Oh man, I, I would love to take a crack at it. I feel like I could still, <laughs> I could still probably, uh, pull it off, but yeah, I don't know how, I don't even remember how I got that gig. I think someone within the athletic department was like, we need a girl. And I'm like, eh, what the heck? I'll try, I'll try my hand at it. And it actually worked out pretty well. <clears throat> so when you graduated and you left WIU, tell us about how you got your first job. Yeah. You know, I feel like, um, everything kind of happens for a reason for better, or for worse. And, um, you know, to complete your, a master's degree in speech language pathology, you need to complete a medical internship and a uh, public education internship. And um, I am very connected to Las Vegas. Um, I have family out there. My brother lives out there. Um, my family owns a condo out there. Um, and I like to vacation out there. So at the time, I was just like, I know that they're hurting for kind of higher education positions why not kind of cast my line out to Vegas to see if they have any internship opportunities. Um, and they, I think that Julie Cox is the, the internship coordinator uh, for the, for the department. I think she reached out to them and they got back to her like within an hour or something like, yes, we'll take her. We'd love to have a student. Um, so I was scheduled to complete my medical internship out in um, Las Vegas. And then um, we were also working to coordinate my public education experience out there as well. Might as well stay the whole, stay, stay the whole Chicago winter in <laughs> Las Vegas. Right? That, was, that was my ulterior motive. Um, but so we had something lined up for school and the school internship and it fell through very last minute. Um, because there were just differences in Nevada law versus Illinois law, so, you know, just some sort of like legal differences between state uh, education. Um, so I was scrambling. I mean, we were probably headed towards winter break. Um, and then I was leaving for Las Vegas in January um, and needed to find an internship for March. Um, and so my father, and he's getting way too much credit on this podcast, <laughs> but... Um, was very close uh, family friends with a speech pathologist in Chicago 
um, who worked with deaf and hard of hearing children her entire life. And, and one night they were, um, you know, with a big group of people and they were chatting about how, you know, oh, my daughter's getting into speech path. And she had given him her card and said, if she ever needs anything, if she wants to do an internship, reach out. And so like we hail married it. Um, and reached out to her and she's in the Southwest sub- suburbs of Chicago. And she immediately said, yes, absolutely. We'll take her. Um, so that was where I did my public education experience, my internship experience. And it was a self-contained special education program exclusively for deaf and hard of hearing children. Um, and so I completed that and, um, more conveniently, um, that speech pathologist who I was being supervised by in the school, she was actually making a family move um, out of state and leaving. Um, so I was asked to interview to replace um, her position at the end of May after I graduated. Um, and, and that's how I got my first job. Wow. So yeah, it's, I mean, it's I like a movie. For a reason. Yeah. It is. It's like it's all been laid out ahead of time and you go, this is sounds like it's uh, like it's meant to be in this direction. Yeah, in the moment, it was pretty brutal. You know, everything yeah. is like when, you know, a little, little dramatic on my end, but the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And of course, now I can look back and, and laugh at that and, and really just um, be thankful, I guess. Now, one of the things you did as you as you got into that position, you decided you needed to get some some more education. You need to get some training. Tell us about what you did. Yeah, so um, the educational program that I took the job with, um, like I said, it, it's exclusively for children with hearing loss. Um, and so the program itself um, and the staff within adopt a communication philosophy of. Um, simultaneous communication. And what that means is everything that's coming out of my mouth should be coming out of my hands um, in sign language. So um, I really didn't know too much sign language when I started my internship there. So I was very much so learning on the job. Um, But once I had signed the contract to take the full-time position after graduation, it was, you know, contingent upon me going back and, and, and taking some formalized um, courses on American Sign Language. So, so literally I graduated, what, I don't know when we graduated in, in, at Western, like May 13th or something. Um, uh, felt great, finally done with school. And then two weeks later, I started at a junior college, um, and the ASL interpreting program. So <laughs> you're never so done really those last, those two weeks of freedom. No, it was good though. Oh, Caitlin, you can, you can never say you're ever done with exactly. education because exactly. it will, right. it will always come back to bite you and you will you're be right. going back for more classes. Yep. So, so talk about the, some of the, the benefits and, and the challenges. I'm sure there are challenges with that job, but what are some of the benefits as well? Yeah. So um, the benefits of being a speech pathologist for uh, children with hearing loss um, is to me connecting families. Um, I think when a parent um, has a, a, a new baby that, that has a hearing loss, it's very overwhelming. And, um, you know, there's a lot of information that's getting thrown at them by multiple different professionals, whether that be, you know, early intervention providers, um, doctors, cochlear implant surgeons, um, you know, it's, it's just an absolute bombardment of information. I think as a speech pathologist, what's great is you can kind of walk, um, you know, side by side with the family as they navigate all that information and, and really help them be the team captain for their child's development. So as your career has moved along, there's been some twists and turns after that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, no regrets, no regrets. Um, so I worked in that, uh, public education placement for five years. So, um, from 2014 to 2019, I was serving in that, in that school and that was great. Um, and then I started to kind of just professionally evaluate, you know, where I want to be, what do I truly want to be doing? Um, and I was looking for opportunities to really empower parents more. Like I felt that 
you know, the work that I was doing in the schools was so valuable and, and, and I think totally important. But at the end of the day, who do these kids spend their most, like most of their time with? I think they're with me like 13% of their week. If you break it down by hours, hmm. um, they're with their family, they're with their parents. So I was kind of looking for a shift in roles as far as I wanted to um, really focus on that parent empowerment um, and, and coaching. Um, and so I started to just kind of put some feelers out there and um, actually, um, you know, Chicago, the landmark in Chicago for, for managing um, children and supporting children with hearing loss, um, you know, there's some large centers across Chicago that offer audiological services, speech and language services. And then, you know, if the parent is parent and family is interested, um, cochlear implant surgery. Um, and so at the time when I was kind of going through this, you know, professional reevaluation process, um, University of Chicago Medical Center was looking for a uh, new clinical program manager and education consultant for their pediatric cochlear implant program. Um, and so I am very familiar with that program because I was a speech path in the schools. I did a lot of communicating with the team members at University of Chicago. So I knew, you know, I know, you know, Dr. Dana Suskin is the director um, and uh, you know, all of the colleagues I spoke with a lot on behalf of my students in the schools. So I was very familiar with them. So I, I said, what the heck, let's go for it. Um, you know, let, let's, let's try our hand at this and went through a very rigorous interview process and, and they offered me the opportunity. So I served as the clinical program manager slash education consultant for uh, a little over two years. Um, and that was fantastic. It took me out of the field of speech pathology, but I do feel like it really, really allowed me to have a, like a totally holistic understanding of the family and the, and the child's journey from birth to adulthood. Um, so yeah, so that, that's what, that's how I got to University of Chicago. Okay. So then as the, uh, as the pandemic <laughs> continues, <laughs> um, through this period of time, you, you, it, you started a new job in February. Is that right? I did. I did. So, um, <laughs> I, you know, just talked so much about how much I love empowering parents and teaching them the kind of keys of the kingdom to helping their child with hearing loss succeed. Um, and it was a, it was a, uh, you know, a great experience, but I was missing that one-on-one -on -one time with kids, you know, as much as I try to play it off, like I'm some serious professional, I absolutely love to, uh, you know, blow bubbles with kids. I love a good game of, you know, Candyland. Um, and I was just missing that, you know, that direct service provider role. Um, with that being said, our program um, and our patient population at University of Chicago was growing as well. Um, so myself um, and the other speech pathologist that is on the cochlear implant team uh, wrote a proposal to the leadership at the medical center to offer um, another full-time speech path position to be offered out, you know, to the public for people to apply for so we could support more families. Um, so I worked really hard on that proposal and then it was accepted and they opened up the position and then I applied for it. <laughs> nice. Well, yes. the, the perfect person for this position. Yeah. You know what? It was, it was just such a good fit. I mean, I, I knew, I know the families already. I know the patients. Um, I know the colleagues that I work with. Um, and it truly is exactly where, where I want to be. So um, never really thought I'd kind of bounce out of the managerial role back into a direct service provider role. Um, but that's just kind of the course it took. And, and now I, I don't really think I plan to go anywhere anytime soon because it kind of is my dream job. That's that's wonderful. I tell you that, yeah, the, Caitlin. It's it's. I and mean, first of all, thank you for for sharing your story because I think it's uh, it is a, a magical sort of beginning to your career, and I'm sure you've got a long. Uh, you're going to have a very long and, and rewarding career in this area. Thank you. Um, but, uh, I, I, I think as, as, you know, in terms of everyone here, uh, at WIU, um, as I said, you know, everyone that I've ever talked to about you just has such high things to say about you. And, and we're very proud 
of your success and, and what you're doing along the way and helping so many wonderful people too. That's just, that's the great thing. Uh, well, thank you. I appreciate you saying that. And I think, you know, Western is a, a place that I will always, always keep very closely in my heart. Um, and I'm hoping to come back sometime soon. Um, I do have to shout out my fiance um, because we actually met at a Western Illinois homecoming tailgate four years after both of us graduated. Really? We, never, we, we graduated the same year, um, never knew each other, and then met at a tailgate four years after we graduated and now we're engaged. So I had, it's a total like leatherneck story personally and professionally. That is awesome. What's his name? His name's Rico. He's a firefighter for the city of Chicago. Well, well, I am glad to have him mentioned in this podcast. He's not in our college, but to. that is <laughs> awesome. To. Caitlin, can we end with, with a sort of a, what kind of recommendations, now that you've had some time in the professional field, what kind of recommendations do you have for a young person that's going into uh, CSD, SPA, the, the, that subject area? Yeah. Um, I, well, one, you've made a great decision. Um, it's definitely the, the best field or fields that you could, you could get into. Um, and then I really would encourage anybody that's, um, starting the department, um, get comfortable with being there. Don't, don't just go there, get your studies done and leave, like hang out, meet your colleagues, um, find a mentor within the staff um, that kind of jives with you as a person, what you kind of want to do professionally. Um, the, the best thing about Western, you know, whether it be athletics or whether it be um, spa is, is the people. I, I think it's such a small um, faculty that they really do absolutely care for every single one of those um, students and you feel it. Um, so you are very supported. Um, and I guess I would say <laughs> uh, find time to, to hang out outside. I know I said hang out at Memorial Hall, but definitely um, it's okay to not study every minute of every hour on the weekends too. So <laughs> that, that student um, coursework life balance is so important and it's only gonna set you up for success later in life when you're in the workforce. Some great advice. I, I tell you that uh, when I meet with freshmen that are coming into the college, one of the first things I say is you need to learn to say yes mm -hmm. to, to find out where you need to be. But then eventually you'll say no because you need to yeah. sleep and eat and study. Right. <laughs> and all those right. other it's, that, it's that balance that all of us are pursuing, right? Right. Well, Caitlin, I hope that we'll get to meet sometime in Macomb, as you said. Hopefully, we'll uh, have you all back uh, for a homecoming or for a football game, and we'll be able to meet in person. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Thank you so much for the opportunity. Go next. So uh, thanks to all of those that are watching the podcast or listening to this episode. We will continue to have alumni on from the college departments on the podcast, and we hope that you will continue to support our departments and schools here at Western Illinois University. So until the next episode, stay safe, take care, and God bless.